On today's show, we dive into part two of our two-part series with Clutch fans. Dave Hardesty himself looking at some of the names the Rockets should be interested in. A Rockets big board spots six through ten. We've already covered A.J. Griffin and Keegan Murray, so we'll dive into the rest of the names on our spots six through ten on this episode coming up right here. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. With the second pick in the 2021 NBA Draft, the Houston Rockets select Jalen Green. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep getting better every day. I'm going to keep perfecting my craft. And every time I step on that floor, I'm coming. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian, also host of Locked on NBA Mondays, host of the State of the Rockets podcast, as well as the founder of ClutchCityControlRoom.com. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin and the show, of course, at Locked on Rockets. As always, appreciate you for making Locked on Rockets your first listen each and every day. And joining us for part two of our Rockets big board spots six through 10 is, of course, Dave Hardesty, founder of ClutchFans.net. Now, Dave, we're continuing our conversation here, you know, as we peruse the spots six through 10 that the Rockets may find themselves trading down into, trading up into. And we are now at the spot where in a crossroads, if you will, of our respective big, big boards where you and I have two different names here at spot number eight. Eight. So I have Benedict Matherin and you have, remind me, Jalen Duran, I believe, correct? Correct. Yeah. So, and I, I'm, I find it interesting that you've got Jalen Duran so high on, on your board here, at least higher than I feel like he's, because he, I feel like he's kind of dropped a little bit, but we'll keep our focus here on Benedict Matherin uh, and we'll revisit Jalen Duran in this sure. upcoming segment. So let's start with Benedict Matherin because I, I think, again, similar to some of these other guys, as far as just the role player type mentality, for him, I think he would slot in almost beautifully for the Houston Rockets at that three spot. And to me, the part of his game that really stood out as I've watched more and more film is his passing as like a connective tissue type piece for, you know, for any team that wants to pick him up. I, I feel like he has that ability where he's not just that. <laughs> I hate to throw Trevor Reese under the bus. He's going to tell me to pull up. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> you know, I feel like there's certain role players that do their job well but that are very one dimensional. And I feel like the Rockets kind of fell into that trap throughout the tail end of the James Harden era where they had a lot of role players who did like their three and G jobs incredibly well. You know, the, the Trevor Reza's, the PJ Tucker's of the world, but were very limited, especially offensively. They weren't dynamic players by any stretch of the imagination. And I feel like Benedict Matherin kind of breaks that mold a little bit where he does fit in. He can give you that three and D player mentality, uh, all those skills, but he's also, you know, a dynamic passer. He can take people off the dribble. He can finish at the rim. So he's not just, he's not just painted into this little corner of, Oh, he can only do two, one, one or two things really well offensively. He's going to give you a diverse array of skills. Yeah, he is. He's strong, athletic, um, and aggressive. I mean, he plays with a kind of a fiery passion, which you've probably seen, um, you know, and I, I think his, his floor is going to be a really solid player in this league. He can shoot threes. Uh, he can defend, like I said, he's athletic. He's got, you know, <clears throat> I think some of that ability to sort of fire up the team, but there's a little bit of star upside in him as well as, you know, if he can develop more of a, a self-creation ability, playmaking ability. And I think that that could come for him. But as a as a for surefire role player in the league, I think Matherin's a very safe bet. I think he's going to fit in really well. <clears throat> he's got an NBA body right now, um, so I mean, you, I, I think you make a good argument. He could be higher than the board on the board than Duran. I just kind of looked at Duran as uh, just this enormous upside as far as a rim protector and possibly defensive player of the year type of guy. But Matherin is going to be really good in the NBA. I don't, I don't doubt that in the slightest. Don't get me wrong. We're going to, we're going to, I'm going to enjoy talking about Jalen Duran here in just a moment. Um, <laughs> but uh, with Matherin too, you know, I wonder how much stock Dave, do you place into this again? You know, you, you mentioned like the shot creation ability, right. Or the, the playmaking ability, you know, I, I, when you look at a player, I think there's, there's two types of guys that can make passes, right. You know, when, when you're playing basketball, there's like play starters and there's, there's like connected pieces, like play, not necessarily play finishers, but guys who can keep a play going, right. Like I don't view him as necessarily like the initiator for an offensive set, 
But when you have other guys who can take the the, the brunt of the initiation duties, right? Like a, a Kevin Porter Jr. and a Jalen Green. And those are the guys who are going to be initially breaking down a defense, you know, getting into the paint, getting the defense scrambling and, and rotating. And then you have a guy like Benedict Matherin who is smart enough to know how to attack off the catch and then make the next read. And I think that's the area of his game that really was kind of a bit underrated and that fans maybe haven't you know seen a ton of is when, he, when you know, Arizona was able to get the defense moving and he was able to attack off the catch or just, you know, get into the teeth of the defense. He was really good at making that right read, getting the ball out to the next shooter or getting it to, you know, a big on the roll, those little things where he was like, as far as being a connective tissue piece. And to me, I feel like the small forward position inherently like has always been that connective tissue piece. I don't know why, yeah. but you look historically and it's like, there have been so many glue guys in the history of the NBA. And they're just like the, the, maybe not the heart and soul of the team, but just the glue guy who holds everything together and isn't necessarily the guy that you're going to write home about. He's maybe the unsung hero of the team. I feel like Benedict Matherin has all the tools to be that guy for an NBA franchise, possibly uh, the Rockets. I, I don't disagree in the slightest. I think he's got that kind of upside. Um, I think, like, like if the Rockets came away with Benedict Matherin and, and some, if, and if it was going to trade down in some significant asset, I wouldn't be disappointed. If the Rockets were able to trade up from 17 to get a guy like Matherin, I'd be ecstatic. So to me, I, you know, uh, he's just a solid pick. I, I've, I've put him in that six to nine range and I've kind of, I guess, put him to the side thinking he's out of reach unless, you know, the Rockets trade down. But uh, I think he will be very good in the league at a minimum similar. You can compare some things to Jabari, like at a minimum, he's going to be a very good role player in the league. He fits, uh, you know, playing off ball against so many different kinds of stars. But I think there's, like I said, a little bit different than maybe with Keegan is, I think there might be upside for, for more with Matherin. How much, you know, Dave, would you think you'd be willing or, you know, wanting to, for the Rockets to get back in a trade if they were to look at trading down into some of these prospects as we're kind of, you know, revisiting these guys and going through our, our you know, six through 10 list here. And we've talked about the idea of the Rockets potentially having to trade back, right? Worst case scenario, they fall to pick number five. What would you be looking to get if the Rockets were trading back down into like the seven or eight spot? Are we talking like another young prospect, a future draft pick? Like, what do you think is the, is the you know, the bare minimum if we're trading back for a guy like a Benedict Matherin at one of these lower spots. So for me, it's an unprotected pick, uh, one on un just one unprotected pick, but that's not too common. So I, I would bet it would be something that's like a, a top four protected pick. Um, and if you're able to target a team, say a Sacramento and you're betting that they just won't, you know, they'll be in the lottery again, could be a really good trade for the Rockets, you know, especially if it's, you know, I think that's the beauty of being in that top five is that we hope that there's five guys that people view as potential stars. And even if it's not the guy the Rockets want, hopefully they can leverage that value. So if they're able to trade down, get a Griffin, <clears throat> um, a Keegan Murray or a Benedict Matherin and get an additional pick that they can use in a trade or something, I'm I'm all for that. Trading up is, is going to be more challenging, especially from 17. That's I would think it's going to cost... I'm not sure. I'm, I'm totally speculating because it's very tough to gauge right now. Christian Woods value, Eric Gordon's value, Jay Sean Tate's value, but it would certainly cost a pick uh, players, something to go from 17 to eight or nine. But I think that would be uh, a dream scenario for the Rockets. Is there, is there any of that future draft capital that the Rockets have, maybe the Milwaukee pick or some of the, the, the picks owed by the Brooklyn Nets that you'd be willing to kind of tap into, you know, to, to move up for a prospect here specifically in this year's draft? I, I personally would trade the Milwaukee pick and 17 to get up to get um, any of those guys six to nine, uh, you know, Griffin, Murray, Duran, Matherin, but I Daniels is in there too. And to be honest with you, as far as realistic trade targets, I kind of start at pick 11 and I think pick 13 is um, like, I would almost give it a, a good chance of being able to do that because uh, you know, the 15th pick fell in the Hornets lap. I mean, it's just a miracle the way that happened for them. They've got two picks. They want to make a leap forward. You know, they may, they may add two rookies, but they've got a couple other rookies in the wings. Uh, you know, if the Rockets are able to get up to, to 13, I, you know, they might get, in my opinion, one of three guys that the Rockets should be targeting. And that's Dyson Daniels, Jeremy Suhan, and Tari Eason, who you mentioned earlier. Any of those three guys could be really impactful on the defense for the Rockets. 
uh, a Houston Rockets Charlotte Hornets trade could be staring us in the face, uh, it, you know, revolving around one Christian Wood potentially as we approach the NBA draft. But coming up, we're going to talk about uh, a prospect that I'm very excited about, and so is Dave, and that's Jalen Duran. After a quick message from our friends over at Built Bar. When it comes to protein bars, you've got to check out Built Bar. They're the number one protein bar on the market, and for good reason. Every single protein bar that Built Bar makes is covered in 100% delicious chocolate. They're not gritty or chalky like other protein bars out there. Every single first amazing, they've got amazing flavors is the number one thing too. Uh, you know, again, they're all coated in 100% chocolate, but the flavors they've got, they got raspberry, strawberry, mint brownie, salted caramel, cookies and cream. Doesn't even sound like we're talking about protein bars. It sounds like we're, we're talking about like delicious, luxurious desserts from like some fancy dessert gallery somewhere. Every Every single bar is low cal, low sugar, high protein, high fiber. Amazing if you're on a keto diet. Amazing if you're trying to cut back a little bit, maybe lose a little bit of weight. You can check them out. Just go to built.com and use promo code LOCK15 to get 15% off your very next order of the best tasting protein bars on the market. Again, that's promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at built.com. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, appreciate you making Locked on your first listen each and every day. For your next listen, go check out the Locked on Now podcast, nightly recaps of every single NBA game, analysis from our local experts, free and available wherever you get your podcast, wherever you're listening to this very podcast. Now a guy that we're both pretty excited about, although we have them in have him in different spots on our big board, Dave, and that's Jalen Duran. And for me, I originally like came away thinking that Jalen Duran might be like somewhere near closer to my top five, like earlier, you know, in this collegiate basketball season. And then I think, I, you know, he kind of dropped off, faded a little bit on a lot of people's mocks, a lot of people's big boards, still floating around that top 10 area. You have him at number eight. I have him at number 10. But I think that he is that really exciting prospect when I look at a guy where I'm just like, man, again, I'm sick and tired of the Rockets being one of the smallest teams in the league. I'm sick and tired of them not having like some true defensive presence in the paint, especially. And Jalen Duran checks all of those boxes and then some for being, you know, he's obviously the second center in the draft when you look after uh, a Chet Holmgren. Maybe depending on who you talk to, maybe some people might have Mark Williams slightly ahead of Jalen Duran. Uh, but Duran, I think, has that that level of like, he's got the size and the physicality to, to bang with the bigger guys, but he's also got that little bit of like, you know, switch ability, right? Where you can put him out on the perimeter. He's got the, the feet, the, his feet move a little bit better than Mark Williams, probably a bit more of a versatile defensive center, if you will. Yeah. You know, as far as athletically measure measurements and all the measurables with this guy, it's um, he checks all those boxes. It's feel for the game. His, his, I guess, motor has been questioned at times. And when I say feel for the game is, does he have that, those instincts, the defensive IQ to become what you think he could become in the league, which is a defensive player of the year type of guy. He's 18 and he's going to be 18 when the, when the games start. I mean, I don't think he turns 19 until late November. There's a ton of upside with Duran, but he, I mean, one thing for sure, this guy cannot shoot. I mean, 10 feet out and beyond, like it's, it's not happening. He is a rim protecting big who I think will be able to switch effectively and guard threes, fours, fives. Um, I think he can be a really uh, potent weapon in the league because of his defensive impact. But he also is, I don't want to say project, but he's going to be a few year, a year or two, I think, to have the kind of impact that you hope because he's got everything, his athleticism. I mean, some of his blocks that you saw in the league are like Dwight Howard-esque, you know, from, from way back in the day. Um, so he could have that type of impact, but the league is also shifting and changing in different ways. So he's going to have to grow um, in a lot of areas and and definitely get a better feel for the game and for the, for the you know, defending the game um, to have the kind of impact that we, we see in him, you know, you know, the feel for the game is such an interesting point because I, I do think you look at a guy like we'll use Alper and Shingun as the example, Alper and Shingun has an incredible feel for the game. Like he processes things so quickly. And even though he not, he, it doesn't have nearly the athletic gifts that a Jalen Duran does. He, he recovers quickly. He adjusts his, you know, spatial awareness, situational awareness, all those things allow him to make some of those impressive defensive stops. He's got those quick active hands. He can recover when he gets beat on drives and he's still, you know, got, gets those recovery blocks from behind. Even if a guy maybe slip slips past him and beats him to the rim, all those things. So I do wonder how much you have to balance you know, when you're evaluating a prospect like a Jalen Duran, how much you balance, okay, he's got the raw athletic gifts. What does his feel for the game look like? Do we think that he's got the, you know, the understanding, the intuitiveness to be that defensive, you know, caliber player, all NBA defense, DPOY type player. 
Um, and then offensively, I, you know, I'm so torn, Dave, on on where the NBA is headed right now. With you know, you've got so many so many players, so many guys who are capable of doing everything on the floor, right? You know, it's a positionless league. You got centers who are shooting threes. You got point guards who can post up. You got guys who can do everything on the floor. I wonder if you don't necessarily. I, I feel like you don't necessarily have to have your five be able to shoot to be successful. I, I do think it helps. But I do think we kind of fall, also fall into a bit of a trap where we think, oh, well, all five players on the floor have to be able to do X, Y, Z. If you can have a player who is incredibly elite at a few different skills, as long as the rest of your guys on the floor, like four out of your five are well-rounded and can space your floor and whatnot, I think there's something to be said for having that level of like vertical spacing that Jalen Duran could provide to this Rockets team. And I think that's something that was desperately or sorely missing this past season because we saw Christian Wood kind of move away from that identity as like a rim running lob threat. He basically turned into almost an exclusively like pick and pop big with very little like above the rim play. If anything, I would, I think I would argue that KJ Martin was the Rockets best vertical floor space for this season with his ability to go up and just get anything you throw around the rim for him. Yeah. And, and Jalen Duran, I think if, if, if deployed properly, could be a nice wrinkle and a nice change of pace for the Rockets offense, even if he wasn't necessarily the starting big alongside like an Alper and Shingun for the Rockets, I desperately do want them to target a, at least one big in this draft, be it Jalen Duran, be it Mark Williams, be it Walker Kessler, so that they can have a dynamic shift in how they play the game to where if you've got Shingun as your starting five, or if you're still with Christian Wood as your starting five, that's cool, great. Then you bring in somebody off the bench or you have another look that you can go to with one of these other guys to have that vertical spacing, to have a rim running threat offensively and to kind of change gears a little bit. Yeah, I think that's very well said. You know, because I, I think as a center position is kind of evolving, I mean, obviously you still would love to have rim protection. You want to have a defensive anchor. But if you can stretch the floor, fantastic. I think that's one of the reasons people love the upside of Chet is that he could be a, a deadly weapon from outside on offense and gives you a few other you know, offensive qualities, but could be in time a, a Gobert level um, defender, a, a, you know, a rim protector and, and things of that nature. In Duran's case, like, you know, I mean, as you mentioned, he, I think he could be a really, really good pick setter, rim runner, uh, alley oop threat. Could do a lot of things in a in a uh, like James Harden run offense. I think he could be a terror. You know, similar to a, a Clint Capella, but with with more athleticism. But uh, it's just he's just going to have to develop a little bit more. I think I, I'm not. I'm with you 100. percent I'm not stressing over his shooting ability. I think if you combined uh, Shingun his feel for the game that you highlighted and and you know, put that with Jalen Duran's measurables, length, athleticism. I mean, you'd be talking about the number one pick of the draft. So I think there's a reason he's, you know, falling or he's down a little bit, but I think uh, he has the potential to be an enormous impact player in the league. You know, this was kind of, and I, you know, this is going to be a nice, nice little segue, but as this is a part one and part two show, like hopefully you've already listened to part one. If you haven't, then I don't know what to tell you, but, um, <laughs> you know, you mentioned earlier on the, the idea that, you know, possibly right. Like a, a AJ Griffin maybe isn't necessarily thrown directly into the starting lineup over say a KJ Martin or a Jay Sean Tate of these guys that we're talking about six through 10, which we've spoken about AJ Griffin, Benedict Matherin, um, Keegan Murray. Now we're talking Jalen Duran, and we'll, we're about to talk about Tari Eason and Dyson Daniels here in our final segment of this two part show. Do you look at any of these guys as like de facto, like, yeah, they would be in the starting lineup day one versus no, they'd probably be more project guys. You know, it's, it's a great question. And because I, I do think as young as the Rockets are, it might cause a little bit of a ripple effect if suddenly they draft somebody and it's just, I mean, in the top five, that that's a different animal. But as yeah. far as these other guys, um, you know, if, if they were to draft Keegan Murray, AJ Griffin, or, you know, is Jay Sean Tate is KJ Martin going to be okay with that? Not that that should dictate anything. I'm just saying, does it cause any kind of a rift? But I think, I mean, Tari Eason, in my opinion, is if he's not starting out of the gate would start pretty quickly. I think he's going to have, uh, I think he's a little bit more ready. He's a little bit older. Um, you know, Keegan Murray probably starts in, in AJ Griffin's case. I, I, mean, I don't want to say he's going to the G league. I doubt that. Um, maybe that's the case with somebody like Shaden Sharp, but I think in AJ's case, they can take it a little bit slower and then gradually put him into the starting lineup. But I think Eason and maybe Murray, maybe even Matherin would start right away. 
Coming up, we're going to shift gears and talk about our final picks here, and that is Tari Eason and Dyson Daniels, who was the surprise pick from, from Dave over here. We're going to get there after a quick message from our friends over at Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your betting stats and sports info. Find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's basketball playoffs and the start of Major League Baseball season. BetOnline is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information from live betting, playoffs, esports, the NBA draft, and more. And speaking of the NBA draft right now at BetOnline, you can take a look at the odds for who goes number one overall in this year's NBA draft. I got Jabari Smith Jr. at number one, plus 100 to be the number one overall pick. You got Chen Holmgren plus 175 to go number one overall. And then Paolo Bancaro, a distant third at plus 325. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action available to you. Bet online. It's where the game starts. And final segment here at Locked On Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball as Dave and I are wrapping up our part two of a two-part series focusing on our respective Rockets big boards six through 10. And this is where we have some diverging opinions. Finally, you know, Dave and I apparently just constantly on the same wavelength, more or less. And so here's <laughs> where we have, you know, a difference in our opinion of our, of our six through 10 guys on our respective big boards. I have Tari Eason. Dave has Dyson Daniels and you know, their respective positions, Tari Eason nine on my board, Dyson Daniels 10 on Dave's board. And first off, I mean, I, I, res I respect the hell out of the Dyson Daniels pick because I think Dyson Daniels has all the tools to be a really interesting pick. I do have some reservations about him, but uh, let, let's talk. Let, give me give me your pitch for why you're so why you've got Dyson Daniels in your top 10 first. You know, it was actually Nathan Fogg who kind of turned me on to him or just his, sort of his strengths, if you will. But it was when he measured out at six, seven to six, eight. That's when I was like, this guy, um, there's something here because I, I first saw him at the rising stars game when he played there. And I thought that this guy just looked uh, mature beyond his years, the way he played, the way he carried himself. And in interviews that I've watched with him, it's the same type of deal. He seems extremely professional and focused. He's young. Um, and he's, in my opinion, possibly an elite point of attack defender, a, a guy you could throw on guards, even some wings and really give them a, a, a tough time. Shooting is the only real knock on him. I don't think he's a, he's not a true point guard in the sense of, uh, you know, a tie tie Washington or, or even a uh, Kennedy Chandler. It's just, I think he's going to be um, a guy who takes care good care of the ball, makes the right reads, the right passes. Um, he comes from sort of that Josh Giddy type background. Um, you know, he's from Australia. And I think a lot of those guys that come from Australia are good playmakers and they're good defenders. I, there's so many things that I like about Dyson Daniels. I think he might be moving up out of any trade up range, but um, I would love to see him on the Rockets. I think he's um, a really good fit with Jalen Green, good insurance if something were to happen with KPJ for any reason. Um, just in, in general, even with KPJ playing very well, he would be a, a very valuable third, fourth guard wing. So I like Dyson Daniels for the Rockets quite a bit. I love the flexibility too when you get towards that range of like guards who are skew a little bit bigger, where you got like you know six six, six seven, six eight, if you will, and then you get into that territory where you look at a guy and maybe you envision a bit of like some like Matisse Thibel there a little bit, at least defensively, where they could be a really great like de defensive piece. Doesn't necessarily need to be the focal point offensively, and you know you can you can instead of having say like two guards and three forwards, or you know two two guards, two forwards, and a true like five or whatever out there. You can run a three guard set, especially if one of your guards is skewing towards a bit of the bigger side of things. I think that's where there are some, you know, some Jaden Ivy truthers out there who are like, hey, just draft Jaden Ivy and run KPJ and Jalen Green is like your two wings essentially next to Jaden Ivy. They've got the size at, you know, them both being about six, six, give or take. Uh, you know, as far as, well, give or take KPJ's hair, depending on if it's cut or not. <laughs> um, right. But so that could be, you know, a dynamic there with, with Dyson Daniels. My, my biggest reservation with him, Dave, is, and I, I find myself so worried <laughs> because you look at guys in the past who've shown like the ball handling, the passing, they've got, they've got the, you know, the, the, the measurables, the athleticism, all of that. And then the shot is broke or the shot is just not there. And I don't, I, I will say, I don't think Dyson Daniels shot is broken. I just think the numbers are not there. And I think there's a distinct difference between broken shot and just numbers not being there yet. He's got a solid form. He's got a good foundation with which to build on. 
the biggest question is, can he ever get to that point? But I, I can't help but get like Michael Carter Williams, like PTSD of like a guy who has all the measurables, can play, make a little bit, can do a little bit of everything, solid defender, you know, all of that, but then just doesn't have the shooting stroke to go along with it to really complete the whole package, which is why he's not like a consensus top five guy. If he could shoot, he'd be a consensus top five guy. Yes. Um, you know, and that's usually a killer for me. For example, I wanted Josh Giddy to go ahead of the Rockets in their later picks. Obviously, he went much higher than I expected. Um, but I was not a fan of Giddy's because he had sort of this elite playmaking ability, but he couldn't shoot, wasn't necessarily a strong defender or anything. I think in in Dyson Daniels case, for me, he is a strong defender. He's and he's not as good of a playmaker as Giddy. That's for sure. I mean, as far as a facilitator and passer, but he will make the right reads. He will make the right passes. Um, and I think the concern with the shot is usually something that kills it for me every single time. But when I watch him, he, it looks good. And I think he got better as the year went on. It wasn't it still wasn't great. I think it was like twenty five plus percent on the year uh, in the G league, but I think it was in the low thirties in the, in the final stretches. I, I think it's something that should get better with a guy like him. And I hate to say that because I have dismissed some players, but as young as because of the shot, but as young as he is with the good form, the, his work ethic and, and the way he goes about things. I, I mean, it was just like a Malcolm Brogdon type of quality about him where he's just not going to back down from anything. It just seems like a guy who's, who's uh I, I, I just said mature beyond his years. Like he's, I think he's going to be a very good professional and a solid leader type of player. Yeah. There's some guy we're, we're going to, we're going to throw out the uh, buzzword here, the Cade Cunningham special, uh, the maturity, right? Like he's a, yeah. he's a very mature player. Um, <laughs> and, and you know what? The Rockets could clearly use some maturity on their team as per, you know, I'm sure Bill Simmons doesn't think the Rockets are a very mature team, but we don't want to entertain any more Bill Simmons talk on this podcast. We, I already allocated my, my quota of like one episode a year having to talk about Bill Simmons. So we're not going to do that anymore here. Um, <laughs> but, you know, kind of the inverse of that, right, is you've got Dyson Daniels, a younger guy. He's going to be just over 19 at the time of the draft. A lot of room to grow and improve. And the flip side of that is a guy like Tari Eason, who is a bit, a bit older, a bit more established. He'll be a little over 21 at the time of the draft. You know, probably more so a bit, you know, more of the player that he's going to be at the NBA level is already kind of showing rather than just this idea of, oh, he's got this crazy sky high potential and he could be this or he could be that. I think Tar Eason is kind of showing what he could be, which is a really explosive, dynamic offensive force. I get some like, I get some like Marcus Morris vibes out of his game a little bit. Um, you know, I think if you're, if you're looking for a comparison is just kind of stylistically how these two guys kind of approach the game offensively. I think Marcus Morris is a good kind of, you know, fit where you look at just the way that Marcus Morris can get almost any shot he wants offensively, you know, be it from the three point line creating for himself, you know, maybe Tari's probably a bit more explosive than Mark Marcus Morris was, or is, I should say. Um, but I think that's kind of the selling point there is you get a really dynamic, you know, big who can create for himself uh, and and hopefully kind of leverage that creation ability for his teammates. I don't know if his passing ability is quite where you would want to see it, right? I, I think that's one of the biggest things on him is he could be a little bit tunnel visioned at times on that LSU team. But I, I think at the NBA level, you know, if he's able to cre continue creating a shot and, and getting, you know, to the bucket, getting, you know, getting opportunities offensively, that's kind of the next step in anybody's game is then turning that into opportunities for their teammate, which I think he'll be able to do It's projecting, but I think he could, he has the skill set to do it. Yeah. You know, I'm a little concerned that, uh, that the success of, of Herb Jones and Herb Jones is in all caps, but that his, his impact with the, uh, you know, in the playoffs and the play in that we saw and his defensive ability is going to raise the stock of Tari. Uh, and I, I don't think Tari's quite as good defensively. He's very good defensive player or, or has, you know, could be a very good defensive player, but I think he's better offensively. You, you nailed a lot of reasons why I think he could have a tremendous impact on the Rockets, just sort of, you know, hair on fire type of player offensively attack the basket. Um, he gets to the free throw line a lot, which a lot of teams just love that trait about uh, any player who's just, you know, physical attack, attacks the basket aggressive. I think there's hope if any of these guys that fall, I mean, like I said, I mentioned Daniel, Suhan and, and Eason. I'm hopeful that Eason does slip through the cracks. I'm, there's there's some high upside guys in this draft, Ty Ty Washington, Jaden Hardy, Usman Diang, um, Johnny Davis, that we're hoping go ahead of the Rockets at 17. And I'm just hoping one of those three slips through the cracks. And if I was to bet anything, if I was to bet on any one of the three, 
it would be Tari that might slip down to 17. And that would be, in my opinion, a steal for the Rockets at that spot. Yeah, and I, I hadn't even gotten to the defensive side of the ball. I'm glad you highlighted that, right? He He's shown a lot of ability on that end. Probably outside of Duran, he's probably the most capable defender you know, of, of, the, of the guys that we've just highlighted. Well, Dyson Daniels is right there on par as well, but di- different types of defenders, right? Dyson Daniels, great point of attack defender. I think Tari Eason could be that kind of help side, that weak side, you know, interior presence a little bit. Good on-ball defender. It utilizes his size really well, even though he's only 6'8". Like it looks like he understands how to leverage his body against bigger players at times. Not necessarily, you know, you don't want to throw him out there against like a true, like, I don't know how he would fare against like an Embiid or a Jokic, right? Like on a switch, but at the same time, like, you know, just uses his size. Well, six, eight two twenty, give or take Um, good, strong body. He's not going to struggle at the NBA level by any stretch of the imagination. Like he's going to come in with an NBA ready body, ready to bang with some of the other big boys uh, at the next level. But, when you look at these guys that we've kind of listed off here, Dave, uh, you know, six through 10 range for each of us, you know, which, which of those guys, uh, again, just to recap very quickly here at the end of our, our two part series, AJ Griffin, Keegan Murray, uh, Tari Eason, Jalen Duran, and Benedict Matherin and Dyson Daniels. So six targets within these five spots. Cause you and I differ just ever so slightly, which of those guys do you think has the highest ceiling of, of this bunch of guys? Wow, that's a good question. Um, I, you know, it's it's crazy, but I really it's like my instant look at that is Griffin or Duran. Even though I I think Matherin has potential to be a star, um, I, I might go Griffin. I, I don't know if I'm balancing too much on on uh, on fit for the Rockets, but I, I just think he's got the potential to be more if his medicals check out okay. If everything seems okay and that there's you know, at just 18, 19 years old, if there's belief that he's going to regain some of that athleticism, um, I think AJ Griffin probably has the most potential there, but Jay, I mean, I'll say this, if the Rockets are able to get to eight or nine, I'll take anybody out of my top nine that slides there. I would feel very comfortable. I don't think there's a huge gap between six, nine, and maybe even 10. Um, so that's in my opinion, a good value spot if you can to get at the bottom of a tier. We've dropped the numbers six and nine too frequently on this part two part series <laughs> Ben's without going dropping. Crazy, I'm sure without yeah. dropping in a quick nice reference. I know Ben's just over there like <laughs> say it, say the joke. Like no, um, but yeah, no, I, I I probably am inclined to agree with you on the AJ Griffin spot, which is why I think he has cemented himself again. You know, barring the medicals, any any setbacks there. Um, you know, which is why he's kind of cemented himself at that six spot for me outside of those top five. And I do think that's that's one of those, you know, er, not again, not an area of concern, but one of those limiting factors when you look at a guy like Keegan Murray or a guy like Tari Eason, just the age being there, they're probably more so already what they are going to be at the NBA level. There's not like this, you know, understanding that they have another gigantic leap that they can take. Yeah, they're probably going to get better than they currently are. But when you look at some of those uh, those younger guys, 18, 19 years old, there's a bit more of an ex- expectation that they'll be able to take another couple steps in their game as opposed to just being a finalized product, more or less, uh, uh, when, they're, when they're being drafted. <clears throat> exactly, exactly. I think that's, you know, that's why a lot of older guys as well get uh, passed on. I mean, 18, 19-year-old guys are, are always in demand. And I think, you know, Herb Jones was older. You know, uh, Chris Duarte was older. Uh, Ochai Agbaji, if I'm not mistaken, is a little bit older. So it's interesting to see the balance of of uh, some of those different age and, groups. And, and those older guys are able to, you know, make a bit more of an immediate impact with some of their teams, right? Like, again, we're seeing it with Herb Jones. We saw it with, you know, Chris Duarte a little bit, just the way that he was able to jump out. And the reason he was, you know, leading the pack of the rookie of the year race earlier this season before kind of falling off and before... Indiana Pacers hit kind of a tailspin and just, you know, finished out as one of the worst teams in the association. The reason he looked so good early on is he was polished. He was right. Re- he was, you know, he is kind of who he's going to be as an NBA player already. So coming in, you've got that, you know, it, there's less speed bumps along the way, right? The speed bumps are more, they're, they're more of those nice, like when you, when you have an established rookie, like one of those older guys, the speed bumps are like those nice, like smooth, mellow speed bumps. Like you're going through a school zone and you just lightly tap them. Whereas like some of these other rookies, you've got those speed bumps that are just like those monstrosities where you hit them and you feel like your car get like a foot of air because yeah. you, you've got some serious, you know, learning, learning curves and some growing pains along the way. So things that you just don't experience with those older guys, you know, and it's funny you mentioned that. Cause like in the, in the mid nineties, for example, when high schoolers were able to kind of come back KG slid to like five, if I'm not mistaken. Kobe Bryant was down to 12 or 13, whatever it was. 
And these guys were such big hits that suddenly it was like, man, we need to take the high schoolers. And then, you know, there were Jonathan Benders and, and different guys that, you you know, people haven't even heard of that came out and they're getting drafted really high, but they just weren't, um, you know, they just weren't, uh, didn't have the, enough upside as those other guys. That's the hard part with Shaden Sharp is Shaden Sharp is a, a really high prospect and some of these other guys as well that are 18, but at least you got one year to look at them in college. Shaden Sharp's case, you don't have any. And you know, anything really to look at. And you're comparing this to guys who a year ago were also top in their class, top five picks and have fallen after playing a year of college, you know, uh, Jaden Hardy, Patrick Baldwin, Jr., those kind of, kind of players. So it's, it's tough. You don't want to pass on the next superstar, but at the same time, you don't have enough, you know, things to compare. That's going to do it for our, you know, I'll call it a relatively comprehensive look at some of the the guys six through 10 that would be really interesting for the Houston Rockets to target either via a trade down or, you know, trade back or trading up in this year's NBA draft. Dave, I appreciate you jumping on the program with me. You know the drill. Let everybody know where they can track you down at. Sure. It's uh, on, it's at clutch fans on pretty much any social media platform uh, on Twitter. And uh, the the website is clutchfans.net. And then you have a, a, a new podcast coming out soon. Do you not? Yes, actually, uh, Lashard um, and Anthony, or AD, you know, they're coming out with a, a podcast called Rocket Fuel, and um, I'm excited for it. Those guys are really smart, really know what they're, they're doing, and, uh, we, this, you know, we, we, we're, I'm looking forward to, to hearing what those guys have to say. It's gonna be uh, it's gonna be very very exciting. I can't wait to hear what uh, what those guys have put together, what you guys are gonna all do together. But Dave, always a pleasure to have you on the program, man. Thanks, man. I appreciate you having me. That's going to do it for our two-part series looking at the Rockets big board with Dave Hardesty, founder of ClutchFans.net, looking at those spots 6 through 10. How do you feel about those prospects? We're going to circle back and do deep dives on each and every one of them, but we wanted to kind of give a preliminary look at some of the names that Rockets fans should be interested in. So let me know in the YouTube comments how you feel about those guys. If you haven't done so yet, consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcast, Apple, Spotify, Google, the Odyssey app, free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Mention the YouTube channel. Go to the YouTube channel. Comment, comment, comment 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 it does wonders for the google algorithm i will love you and be indebted to you forever if you go comment just say go rockets on the youtube channel also subscribe all that good stuff but as always thank you so much for watching thank you so much for listening and we look forward to having you back right here at locked on rockets your daily podcast home for everything houston rockets basketball